Vice President and Conference Organiser Pramukh, um, it really is a, a great pleasure to be here today um, and privilege supporting this 43rd Annual Scientific Congress of uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of Thailand and, of course, the presence of the uh, second joint surgical meeting with uh, the Ministry of Public Health. So, fellow presidents, past and present, new diplomats, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've chosen a title today, Training the 21st Century Surgeon. I would have to say at the outset that I don't have all of the answers. But one of the things that intrigues me is that much of what we have heard from the Deputy Minister has striking parallels with the arguments that I will try to develop as to how we might go forward to train surgeons in the next decade or so. Now, if you'll forgive me to begin by looking backwards, because I think there are some messages that we need to relearn. And I'm not a great fan of quotations, but this particular one, study the past if you would wish to define the future, I think we can take a lot from the message here by Confucius. And I would like to begin by talking about the past, then to say a little bit about the present, and then hopefully to concentrate on the future. But let's look at this beautiful old painting by one of the Dutch masters to begin with. And if we look here, we see a patient, we see a master, and in the background, sitting, doing very little apart from observing and absorbing, we see an apprentice, very much following and studying the master of the trade. Fast forward to my training, and I probably went through an apprenticeship like many of the senior players in this room today. And just to concentrate on a few of the aspects, a few of the advantages of being an apprentice under this system, it was one-to-one -one tutelage. You had a good role model. And if your mentor and tutor and trainer was capable, he would match the load with your capacity. So you weren't overloaded, you weren't underloaded. It was just set right. And there were further advantages too. Obviously, it was the authentic workplace environment and you had the opportunity to work with real live teams and not in simulation. Now that's if it goes well. But what if it doesn't go so well and that you find that you are paired with a tutor or a trainer who very much has his own mind? It might be pretty hit and miss. You might be faced with one man's approach, which might, which might not be yours, and the rigor of the assessment in his hands or her hands might not be quite what you would expect. So there were advantages and disadvantages to the apprenticeship model. So what about the present? Where are we now? Well, there are many drivers for change about the way we have to train the next generation. And here are just a few. This is in the UK. The number of training hours, the number of working hours, have been reduced from 120 hours per week, which we were exposed to, down to 48 hours a week. And if you want to convert that to hands-on flying time, that means a reduction in clinical professional exposure from 30,000 hours during your training program down to 6,000 hours. And I rather like the quote which has come from a group of our trainees who published in the BMJ. And they said, and I agree, to become competent in one-fifth of the time requires you either to be a genius, undertaking intensive practice, or accepting lower standards. And here's another problem. This is the growth of medical knowledge over the last 120, 150 years. And it has an exponential growth. 
The knowledge doubling curve is such that a surgeon, perhaps taking up independent practice when he's 32 years old, will be faced with 22 doublings of knowledge by the time he reaches his 65th birthday. How are we going to keep him or her up to date? And here's another thing. This is the accrued data from the ISCP in the UK, the Intercollegiate Surgical Curriculum Programme, looking at logbook experience, consolidated logbooks for appendicectomy for 2,000 surgical core trainees. That's early years surgical training. And if you look at their experience, you'll see that perhaps the mean is that they've performed one They've assisted six, and they've been supervised in six procedures. A frighteningly small number of operations when we consider what we might have been exposed to. And before you blame that on the reduction in hours, I'm intrigued by this report from a group of fellowship program directors from the USA who've looked at the skills and competence, in inverted commas, of the general surgery residents at the end of their program. And they feel that perhaps a fifth are not ready for the operating room, a third lack a sense of patient ownership, and a third are not able to perform cholecystectomy independently. So clearly, there are other issues afoot. And these are some of the extra challenges that we all face. Patients are in for a very much reduced length of time. So a given trainee will only get a surgical snapshot, perhaps, of a particular patient's pathway, especially if he's working a very tight on-call system or work hour pattern, so he might only see the patient at one stage of the career. Patients are also managed very much algorithmically. There's a flow of a patient's management that a young surgeon in training doesn't get a chance to really influence. It's preset for him. And then, of course, all of us are faced with the need to keep pace with technology. And there are particular problems around that. And I think uh, we have heard already today about the potential of the generation gap interfering with how we train the next generation. So if we look at the three most recent generations, Generation X, Generation Y, and Generation Z, each one of them are a different medical learner, and they can be separated by decades in age. Currently, we have digital natives. All of our trainees have known digital application since they went to school or to medical school. Before them, the generation was digitally immigrants, okay? So they had learned the techniques of digital technology during their education. And of course, they are all being trained by people like me who could be considered digitally naive because I still have had some trouble getting to grips with the latest technology. And it's very interesting if you compare these generations in the workplace. Millennials are Generation Y or Generation Z. Then we've got Generation X. Then we've got Baby Boomers, born before 1963. And then you've got me somewhere over here, well off the scale. But if you look at the difference between these generations in the workplace, as you might expect, the earlier generation are not particularly tech-savvy. The latest generations are highly tech-savvy. And there is a considerable difference in the approach of the various generation to collaboration with their colleagues. So we have to take all of these considerations into account. And then if we look at the learning in comparison, the traditional learning is the sort of learning that I would have been exposed to, 
and this is the evolving learning patterns. And there probably isn't time to go through all of these in great detail, but I would just suggest to you that some of the differences are that the current and next generation of training is very much going to be led by the trainees themselves and, that by, and not by ourselves. They will be looking to use multiple sources rather than the textbook that I might have used, and we can talk about that in a moment or two. And then, of course, as we've heard from the Deputy Minister, there is a slide across from outcome-based assessment to competency-based assessment. So is the future all going to be electronic learning platforms? Well, this is a list of all the advantages of e-learning, its accessibility, the ease of update, how to distribute it is so simple, and indeed you can craft it and make it bespoke for individual trainees. And there's no doubt there's a huge amount of evidence out there which shows this is an efficient way of learning with improved acquisition of knowledge by all of those taking part. And you only have to look at the web to see how popular this is in surgical education. Web Surge, one of the many websites, claims to have 360,000 registered users worldwide. So, highly significant. And then, of course, our own college, the Edinburgh College, has the Edinburgh Surgical Science Qualification Portfolio, or Edinburgh Surgery Online, as it's now called. And this is a way of supporting interactively trainees in their quest either for postgraduate diplomas or indeed the membership and fellowship examinations that our college offers. Looking further afield and more widely, what about using massive online open education courses, unlimited participation, no fees? There's certainly some evidence that these are being adopted by medical specialties, but it is rather slow in its adoption in the surgical field. Is it of any benefit? Well, this study um, in medical education shows that there is a positive impact in MOOC courses, especially in remote, rural, and resource-poor areas of countries. So there's perhaps one way forward for parts of a nation where candidates and trainees might get difficulty having access to mainstream learning. And what about social media? Well, this study from uh, the University of Sussex in the UK looked at Twitter, wiki, blogs, Facebook, all of these things, and interestingly studied the US population and found, as I've outlined, that about a third of US residents use online material for exam prep, and 80% use online sources for anatomy. And what about video games? Tales of a misspent youth? Maybe, maybe not. There's some evidence to show that gamers, habitual gamers, make less errors and have faster acquisition when they learn laparoscopic skills or endoscopic skills. That doesn't extend to open surgery or traditional surgical skills, but it clearly is an area where experience in the gaming world might help you to become a better surgeon. And what about in the UK? Well, our college has been interested in developing a 3D virtual human being in association with the Glasgow School of Art. And this particular piece of technology is aimed to act maybe one day as a replacement for the anatomy dissection room because the human being can be completely split into its component parts and reassembled. And here's just a, a brief example. Uh, this is a 2D version, obviously, because it is on this screen. But you could imagine the attraction of being able to access 3D on your own laptop, a human body, which you could dissect down into its component parts. A huge amount of potential here, I think, and it may be just something that grasps the attention and interest of the next generation. 
So what about the next generation and the future? Well, a key problem here is, of course, time. The trainers, the training environment, the training program, the trainee, and the very vital service commitment all compete for the same limited amount of time. And I think, too, we also need to ask ourselves, what are we trying to produce? We should be looking to produce a trained surgeon who is patient-focused, equipped with technical and non-technical skills, and capable of independent emergency safe practice. If we achieve that, we'll have achieved a lot. And the icing on the cake will be that some of them will have leadership skills, training skills, and the very few will have the ability to progress forward clinical and scientific boundaries. But one of the challenges that we have in the UK is that our trainees look towards highly specialist careers, mainly in elective practice, which are easy to maintain. Emergency and general surgery is seen as a low priority and a less attractive career. And of course, our general public have a preference for a specialist rather than a generalist. And if you ask our trainees what sort of career they want, they want a specialist career. They don't want an emergency or a general career. So clearly, there's a conflict there, especially when you look, and this is 2016 data for Scotland. Here are all the Scottish hospitals, and here are the patients that are admitted, and the dark area represents the emergency patients, and the pale area represents the elective patients. So I suspect that is something which is true here in uh, Thailand as well. So training for the future. Somehow, we've got to match career aspiration with society's need. And I think, as we heard from the minister, we need to change the mindset, we need to change the curriculum, and probably the assessment as well. And we need to keep emergency surgery as a core activity. So how can we make this all happen? Well, if we're going to redesign our training, we've got to think it through carefully. We can't make any mistakes at the paper or blueprint stage. And indeed, as you'll hear tomorrow when Professor Rowan Parks talks at length about improving surgical training, that is one of the ways our UK surgical training sees as a way forward. And I would strongly recommend you have the opportunity and take that to hear what Professor Parks has to say. So I will skate over that. Sufficient to say that it is our view that we need to take the pressure of trainees in training so that they have more time to be trained and less time to deliver service. And with that in mind, we've recently had our triennial conference in Edinburgh, which looked at how the modern surgical team, incorporating the extended role of the nursing profession, might just help to achieve that aim. And a year or two ago, we launched our faculty of perioperative care, exactly with that in mind, to provide a home for those nurses who are going to support delivery of surgical care within the surgeon's umbrella. So to look forward, these are the things that we need to do, I believe. We need to professionalize our educators and trainers and make them feel valued. We need to make sure that the next group of trainees are well mentored and coached. We need to engage simulation, and I believe that word apprenticeship needs to be revisited. How should we should training and education be professionalized? Well, this is one way. Our college has launched a faculty of surgical trainers. It's open worldwide. You don't need to be a member of our college, but it provides a platform and a scaffold and a framework that might support you and help to develop your interest as a surgical trainer. Here's one of my role models, Professor Sir Alfred Kashiri from Dundee, where I trained, he talked about the launch of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the UK as the biggest unaudited free-for-all in surgery ever. We obviously need to avoid that by careful use of simulation when we're developing new techniques. 
But it's more than just the operation. This is a slide which just briefly encompasses the extent and nature of adverse events in UK healthcare, not an insignificant number. But if you look at this, we believe that one half of these could have been avoided and that they're not due to a lack of technical knowledge. But they are, in fact, related to this loose group of human factors or non-technical skills. And the key problem being poor communication, teamwork, and a lack of leadership skills. All of these are things that we need to concentrate on when we're going to teach the next generation of surgeons. And in Scotland, rather euphemistically, we have a boot camp, which is as brutal as it sounds, but it gives the opportunity for trainees to gain all of these skills in an artificial environment, and non-operative technical skills and human factors are the core of all this. So what about the modern apprenticeship? Well, it'll be different from the old, no doubt. If you go on the web, you will see that many frontline industries across the world, here's the civil service in the UK, all recognize the value of apprenticeship. And I believe an apprenticeship model going forward will have all of these skills embedded in the trainer. And if we had more time, we could explore that in detail. It is perhaps something we can talk about over the next few days. Central to this, I believe we have to recognize that not everybody is a born educator and trainer. Some of us have less skill than others, and I believe that we should leave the training to those who have the skills. There's no shame in not being a trainer and being somebody who instead concentrates on service delivery. So what if I was going to look forward to the future? What would I think of? Well. I think we need to have flexibility built in to our next generation of trainees so they can take on board innovation and changes in patients' need. I think training and educational models, modules rather, should be freely available and delivered to doctors at any stage of their career as and when necessary. And we need to move away from the concept that you are a fully trained doctor at the end of training. You are, in fact, just embarking on lifetime learning. So these are the things that I think will change. I think we will need to preload surgical trainees before they get into the workplace with clinical survival skills, not textbook knowledge. Competency-based training is frankly at a fairly early stage in its evolution and we need to make sure it becomes more than just a tick box exercise. We're going to have to embrace simulation in training and some of the smart technology that we've mentioned. And all of us, trainees and trainers alike, will need to become lifelong learners. What won't change? The working hours. We will always have to work, I believe, within the constraints of the working times set by our various governments. Society will continue to have ever-increasing expectations of our ability. We will always have to work beneath a glass ceiling with fixed resource limitations. And, of course, the growth of knowledge is unstoppable. My final thought... And this comes from one of my heroes, Richard Branston, from Virgin Atlantic Airlines. And this is his quote. Train people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough so they don't want to. Thank you. <laughs>